Hi, I'm Lucas Rogers and I'd like to welcome you along to the Rogers Property Group. Today in this video, I'm going to be going through a list that I've compiled of the 15 biggest mistakes that property investors make. And I've seen this happen time and time again, so I thought it'd be worthwhile sharing it with you. Mistake number one, buying an old property and thinking it's a bargain. You know, I see people getting out there and, and, and going and buying an old property and thinking it's a bargain, but they think it's a bargain because they haven't actually crunched the numbers. It might, you might save 10 or 15 grand or even you know $20,000 on buying an older style property to start off with, but what happens is, is that property actually costs you a whole lot more from your cash flows and it's very expensive to hold. Old properties, one, if you buy a second hand property, it doesn't matter even if it's a week old, if you buy a second hand property, then you're not entitled to claim the tax deductions on the fixtures and fittings of that property because you didn't put them in. So that actually can cost you 30 to $40 a week in actual cash flow just because you didn't, didn't understand that. So that's one of the reasons. The other thing is, is from a rental perspective, the rents are a lot lower on older property and the maintenance is a lot higher. So while you've made a few dollars, saved a few dollars up front, I think in the longer term, it's a worse investment because of the fact that it ends up costing you too much to hold. So my advice is if you're going for a buy and hold strategy, then buy absolutely brand new. So you maximize your rents, maximize your tax deductions, being depreciation, and you're minimizing your maintenance. So that's number one. Number two, a mistake that I see a lot of investors make is buying in their own suburb. You know, you live there yourself and you think, this place is fantastic, and why don't we own another property here? And plus the benefit of that is, I can go and have a look at it whenever I like on my way home from work. That's a really bad move. It's a bad move in so many ways. Firstly, if it's around the corner, and you can go and have a look at it after work, generally that's what you do. And that's just a huge waste of your time. With your property investing, when you're starting to build up a property portfolio, that pro those properties need to, to be of no concern to you. They need to effectively sit in your bottom drawer and you not to worry about them too much while you focus on your own work life. Very, very important. And the second thing is as well, who's to say that your particular suburb is going to be a great growth suburb? You need to be looking at the supply and the demand of a number of different places and looking at where the, uh, the supply deficit gap is to enable you to get some capital growth. That may be your suburb, it might not be. So just don't jump to the conclusion of always buying in your own suburb, because one, it can be a bit of a waste of your own time, and two, it may not actually be a good investment. A uh, third one that I see is buying a high rise unit. People run into this sort of problem all the time because they get sucked in uh, by clever salesmen. You know, they go up and see these high rise units, uh, you know, on the Gold Coast or a place like that. Got fantastic views and people buy these things emotionally. Oh, everybody would want to live here. But in reality, they're terrible investments. And why is that? Well, one, they have very little land content, probably about 5%. So therefore 95% of your asset is actually depreciating or going backwards in value. So it's not a great investment at all. And the second thing is with apartments and units, they can be oversupplied very, very fast. So I wouldn't be buying a high rise apartment or a unit of any description. <clears throat> okay, mistake number four, selling property. Well, it is a mistake. You might think, oh no, well, how do you get your money out? There's lots of different exit strategies that you can take your money out of a property without actually selling it. The problem is with property is it does take a while to build up a decent sized property portfolio and get significant growth out of that to enable you to retire. Most people aren't very patient. In today's world where everything's instantaneous, people aren't prepared to wait. And when they don't see the property growing in value initially, then they sell it off. I've seen so many people sell off properties just prior to a property boom. So my advice to you is never ever sell off a property. Always keep it. Okay, number five, keeping your own home as an investment. This is actually negates the, the problem we just spoke about in four. As I said, never ever sell off a property unless it's your own home. When you're upgrading your home, you don't want to keep your old home as an investment. Because what's happening there is, you've probably paid down a significant amount of the loan on your current home. 
And then what you're doing is you're going out and you're creating a big non-tax deductible debt by buying a new home. What you want to focus on with your wealth building is reducing our non-tax deductible debts and increasing our tax deductible debts. By keeping your old home as an investment, it's going to have a very little tax deductible debt on it, but yet your new home is going to have a very big non-tax deductible debt on it. It needs to be the other way around. So therefore, and I ran into this situation myself, if you're upgrading your own home, don't keep your old home as an investment, sell it. Sell it, take the equity or the cash out of that and put it into your new home, thus reducing your non-tax deductible debt. Okay, so that was number five. Number six, and this procrastination. Procrastinating is one of the worst habits that you can have as a property investor. To be honest, it's probably one of the worst habits that you can have in life in general. I was reading a little bit about procrastination recently and they said actually people that procrastinate aren't as healthy as people who don't procrastinate. And people and students that actually procrastinate never do as well as students that don't procrastinate. Why? Because procrastination actually puts pressure on your memory, okay? And it actually stresses you out as well. You know, property investing is like a great big game of Monopoly. Everybody's looking to buy the best properties. It doesn't matter if it's an up market, down market, whatever it is, if there's a significantly good property on the market, then that property will get taken up. If you're the sort of person that's procrastinating and not knowing what to do, then you're gonna miss out on that. I've seen people procrastinate under the disguise of research for four, five years. If you're the type of person that's procrastinating over the last couple of years in the Sydney market, I mean, the Sydney market went up at $150,000 in the last calendar year. That's $3,000 per week. It's pretty hard to save that money. If you're the sort of person that procrastinates for six months, well, that's just cost you $75,000. So my advice is do not procrastinate at all. It's a, it's, a, it's a bad thing, it's a disease. Okay, number seven, focusing on rent and not capital growth. Rule 101 when it comes to property investing you need to focus on capital growth. Why is that? Well, capital growth initially is not taxed. When it is taxed, if you decide to sell, it's taxed at a lower rate. Capital growth is actually compounding and capital growth in the longer term will build a lot more wealth for you than rent ever will. Even if you have a property that's $100 a week, cash flow positive, that's $5,000 over the space of a year, which is not a huge amount. When you add that onto your taxable income and you take 40% off for tax, then you end up with very, very little at the end of the day. But if you've got a property that you buy for half a million dollars and that property is growing by you know, five to 10% per annum, that's a big difference there. So guys, focus on capital growth, not rent. Rent is just a byproduct to enable you to keep the property and grow your property portfolio. Okay, so that was number seven. Uh, number eight, buying regional. Uh, a few years ago, I'm sure people would have told me to eat my words, where people were buying property in regional markets, mining towns and so forth, and doubling their money in the space of a couple of years. I never once, even while those markets were booming, I never once put a client into those markets because it goes against my investing philosophy. Those areas are risky. And people that have purchased in those areas their, their, their nightmares have come home to roost. I've seen people uh, buy property in places like Moorumbah, spend $800,000 on that because the property is getting $1,000 a week in rent or $1,300 a week in rent. Three months later, the property is worth $250,000 and it's getting $225 a week in rent. Massive, massive losses. And the, region, and the reason why regional markets do so poorly is because they generally rely on one type of job. And when that job dissolves or closes up, or whatever it may be, everybody moves back to the cities where the jobs are. Less people, more supply of property onto the market, prices are gonna plummet. So my advice to you is stay safe. Buy within a reasonable distance of the capital cities. And in regards to the capital cities, I'd probably stick to Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, and to a lesser extent, Perth. Okay, so that was, uh, that was number eight. Number nine, taking advice from unqualified people. 
You know, there's a lot of um, property marketing organization and salesmen out there at the moment where the, the people selling property and giving financial advice are actually totally unqualified and unexperienced. And it annoys me because it gives the industry such a bad name to see these people out there operating. Whenever you're dealing with anybody, make sure you check their qualifications and their experience because you don't want somebody giving you advice on a half a million dollar investment who's been selling furniture at Super Amart the week before. Check them out. You can get yourself into a lot of trouble if you go down that track and you haven't checked somebody out. Okay, so um, that was number nine. Number 10, buying emotionally. With property investment, uh, you're not buying a home to live in. I see a lot of people go out there uh, looking at investment property and thinking, oh, well, that's not the color that I like or, or you know, this kitchen is not the exact layout that I like. You don't have to worry about that sort of thing. That's just emotional investing. Things that you need to look at are the numbers. You need to be looking at the demand for property in that area, so your population growth. You also need to be looking at your supply. Is it undersupplied? Is the area oversupplied? They're the type of things that you're looking at. How close are the amenities? Schools, shops, where are the jobs in the area? Where's the transport? Okay, so don't buy emotionally. It might not be a place that you'd like to live yourself personally, but that's not the issue here. You'd be looking at it as an investment, something that you're going to be making money out of. So please, don't buy emotionally. Okay, so that was 10. Number 11, not setting goals. Very, very important of not, not only property investing, but anything that you want to achieve in your life, you have to set goals. And the reason being is goals give you a target, something to aim for, and allow you to make the correct decision every time. Because if, you're, if, you, if you've set a goal and you have a path to follow, then you'll know which way to turn, left or right, because only left or right is going to take you closer to your goals. So what it does is it gives us a, a target, something to aim for. I can't stress to you the importance of setting goals in life in general, and especially financially, because it's very, very hard to achieve anything unless you clearly define what it is that you want to achieve. Okay, number 12, not doing your homework. Well, people can come unstuck regularly. Whenever you're looking at a property, as I said, key things to think about is land content. How are we gonna get our capital growth? What's the supply and the demand like in the area? Don't get talked into buying something by some unscrupulous salesman who, as I said, was you know, might have been selling furniture at Super Amart the week before. So it's very, very important that you do your own homework so that you can sleep easy at night when it comes to your investment. Okay, 13, renovating. Well, I don't think that renovating is a great way to build wealth. People, I mean, that might be okay if you're a builder and you can spend every weekend on it, but the problem is with renovating is the returns generally aren't as good as people might think. 95% of renovations actually go way over budget. And people also forget that while the property is getting renovated, that the property is actually off the market and is not getting rented. So if you're missing out on $500 a week, that property is costing you $2,000 a month in missed rent alone to be sitting there while you're renovating it. So you need to get it done very, very fast. So if your property goes over budget, takes too long, it can be costing you a lot of money. Not only that, on top of that as well, you also have a loan to be dealing with, okay? And the longer it goes on, the more interest you're accumulating. So I don't think that renovating, unless you wanna give up your job and do it full time, I don't think renovating properties is a good way to build wealth. With your wealth building, you wanna focus on what you're good at, and that is whatever your job may be. Then what you wanna do is you wanna be buying properties on the side as an investment, put them in the bottom drawer so you can effectively forget about them and concentrate on your family and your work life while your properties are growing in value. And then review your property portfolio every so often. That's the key way to build wealth. Being underinsured, I have seen people being underinsured and I've also seen people um, underinsured in regards to not having um, landlord protection you need to have landlord protection and you need to check out your insurance thoroughly uh, every year. It's very, very important because if you're buying property in your own personal name, if somebody slips over in your backyard and you don't have public liability or something like that, 
you can get yourself into some significant problems, okay? Your property could be up for grabs, that person can sue you. So definitely check out your insurance. And I can't believe that people would actually be out there owning property, investment property, without having landlord protection. It's probably two to $300 a year. But if that tenant trashes your house or leaves without paying your rent, what are you going to do? If you're landlord protected, then you're fine. If not, then you're gonna find yourself in some trouble. So please, make sure that you're thoroughly insured. And 15, not using a property manager. I see this all the time, people trying to self-manage properties. You have to be very, very careful when you're self-managing properties because the Residential Tenancies Act um, and actually evicting a tenant and so forth can be a minefield, it really can. And if you're managing your own property and you don't send the notice to the client or to the tenant, I should say, at the right time, then it can be negative and so on. So look, please, I encourage you to use a property manager. It will just relieve a whole lot of headaches for you um, and they do a lot of work for their money. So guys, I hope you've enjoyed my, uh, my top 15 mistakes that I see investors make and I hope it's been of some assistance to you. And if you've got any questions, please feel free to email them in the office. There's a link below to our website uh, and I look forward to chatting with you again soon.